the spokesperson. I have to go with you to like the big meetings and stuff to talk to the corporate people. You, you want to do the corporate stuff? Yes. Yeah, sorry, I just let you know, I just started recording just so people see what I, what I got to do. Oh, with. wow. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make it seem like I'm just like the just worst. Just a diva. <laughs> diva Darsha. I'm not a diva. I just feel as a spokesperson, I should be included in in the corporate things. In the corporate things. And knowing that you wear a hoodie and joggers to those meetings, <laughs> I won't feel so out of, out, out of touch. I can wear like a suit because I look good in the suit. Yeah. I ain't, I'm not even trying to like to hype more. myself up, yeah. but like I actually do look good in the suit. But I don't feel comfortable in a suit. I don't yeah. feel like a suit is me. Like right. hoodies and joggers and ones that's me yeah like, that's that's, that's just me. Shoe. good afternoon right. chicago and welcome to all of our supporters from around the country i'm jamal cannon founder of the block and i'm so excited to have you with us for our biggest accomplishment ever welcome to the virtual grand opening of the block i wanted to start with darshan's uh, interview piece because it really highlights to me a really important facet of my leadership of this organization the fact that our young people our fighters get to see me being my most authentic self uh, and seeing themselves represented in a position that they see as powerful uh, is, is a meaningful touch and especially important for me as a black man to represent right now. Uh, so I had a tux ready to go, but I decided to come as my most authentic self, not in a hoodie because it's too hot for that, uh, but in a, just a t-shirt and joggers uh, to, uh, to, to stick with the spirit that Darshan was speaking of. We find ourselves at a difficult crossroads. Um, not only was our community reeling from the impact of COVID-19. You know, we had about 20% of our fighters had a, a family member lose a job. Uh, many were saying that they were um, feeling mentally and emotionally unwell and the health impacts of COVID-19, as well as the economic impact of COVID-19, um, took a, had a much bigger impact on the black and the brown community uh, in the city of Chicago. And while still figuring out how to recover from that, uh, we got the news of just an onslaught of racist violence uh, that was taking place around the country, and that led to uh, protests and looting in our city. Um, I'll kill some of the magic for you right now. This is not a live portion of this uh, of, of this Zoom video, uh, but I will do it all in one take. Uh, this isn't live because we decided we needed to mobilize in ways that we hadn't mobilized before. Right now, uh, inside of the building, at the time of the virtual grand opening, we are packing up boxes for a food pantry that we're putting on for our community. The grocery stores were looted. Uh, they were closed down for a few days. Uh, and we recognized that people in the community didn't have a place to go and shop. They didn't know where to get the basic goods that they needed. And those there were some still hurting from the impact of COVID-19. Uh, they couldn't afford some of the things that they typically have. Uh, so we decided to step up because we had this new space uh, that was donated to us. Uh, we are able to serve our community in ways that uh, we've never served before. Uh, this is a massive step up for our organization. Uh, and though we are in really difficult times, I think we are positioned uh, to make our greatest impact yet. On that note, uh, every dollar that will be that is given today is going to be matched on a one-to-one -one basis by uh, Bruce and Vicki Heyman. I cannot thank you all enough for for providing that match for us, and uh, and that match will go up to six thousand dollars. So um, everything that you give today uh, is doubled, so you can double your impact by donating during this virtual grand opening. I cannot wait to show you the inside of this building. Uh, there are a few different things to think about today. Um, a, few th a few different things we'll go through today. Um, so uh, the virtual tour is gonna be intermixed with some interviews that I did with some young people, uh, some parents, and then some of the ways that you can get involved and you can support the block uh, beyond your donation during this virtual grand opening. Uh, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. And I look forward to showing you what we're about to do.
When we build out to our capacity, up to 300 young people can walk through these doors every year. Many have come in with their fists clenched, ready to fight. And for good reason. A lot of the kids that we worked with have been exposed to an unthinkable amount of violence. They don't trust the people and the systems put in place to protect them, and they struggle to get basic resources necessary to live happy, healthy, and hopeful lives. On top of that, many of the programs put in place to serve as an outlet in other areas are selective or non-existent here. People talk about kids from the West Side as if a lot of them are making bad choices, when in reality, some of them have no good choices. Boxing gives them a choice. Do I take my feelings out on the streets? Do I internalize them and take it out on myself? Do I, do I give up and wallow in despair? Or do I stand up and fight? When young people join the block, they join a community, a community that is committed to providing guidance, resources, and helping every young person reach their full potential. So kids come here wanting to learn how to fight, and we teach them how to fight for their success. With our donations being doubled today, we have a great chance uh, to take another step to make this a reality for more young people. Throughout the course of the year, we need to expand our transportation program so kids can get to and from the block safely. We're going to hire young people so they can build a work history to shore up their resumes. They can earn an honest dollar and help support their families. And we're going to expand our exploratory learning, exploratory learning services. We have kids in this program who've never been downtown. We have kids who've never seen the lake. We have young people who've never been on an elevator. By expanding our exploratory learning services, we get to show kids the greatness that is Chicago and help expand their horizons. We are not a boxing nonprofit. We're a justice and equality nonprofit, filling the holes in a system that should not exist so that we can impact lives. Join us. So definitely boxing was something that I had no idea was going to help me so drastically. Uh, before I started boxing, uh, I was re wasn't really a very confident person. I struggled with, uh, you know, communication. Uh, you know, I didn't really have much friends. I was allowing myself to make decisions that fulfill my emotional needs. A lot of people that I know had like the same issue that I have, like being socially awkward, I guess, or being like timid around people. Most kids, I heard they gang bang and stuff, and getting killed. I've always been like that one person and people always like, you got the potential, you got the potential, but I don't think I really saw it for real. Like around the time that I joined the block, I was going through like some very deep uh, depression, some very, some very bad emotional stuff, like bad trauma, bad anxiety. I was just overall broken and I just was looking for something to belong to. I expect it just to be about boxing, to be working out, but I guess I was wrong. It's been more than just about boxing. It was more like of a family. I didn't expect the coaches and the people to be that caring. I just expected, uh, you know, a normal training space. I guess like boxing gave me a sense of being more open and not being afraid of like showing others who you really are. More opportunities, like going like outside of boxing, you going out to eat, going to games. Uh, college tours. It was really helpful to clearing my mentality and to eventually overall overcoming my depression. Boxing brought me more like peace and happiness than any other sport that I've ever played. When I realized that I was stumbling and that I didn't like the direction my life was going, I did know there was one place that I can lean on for support to keep me from hitting the ground when I tripped and stumbled, and that was the block. Uh, boxing has helped me outside of the ring with my confidence and uh, the way the way I conduct myself, the way I speak to people. I don't drug do, I don't gang bang. All I do is just box and play my game, and people respect me for doing that. You come across so many different people from so many different backgrounds, and they, you know, they automatically assume, oh, you're from Chicago. Like, you must uh, be in a gang. They want to make sure we're safe and we have everything we need as, like, a person or as a family. It has given me the discipline and, and the fortitude of mind to be able to see through any goal that I could set for myself. I was able to clear my mind with all the anger, with all the sadness, and just every bad vibe that I had within me, I was able to clear it with just like the swing of a punch. Boxing has really like proven to me my own ability. When I'm boxing, I have let out some of my anger, some of my sadness when me and my family are going through a problem. I love the block because it feels like home. Once you walk into the doors, you're immediately a part of that family. It, it almost feels like home. It helps you build confidence and 
You can use that confidence anywhere you would like and anytime you like. Having this space means more than just having a place to box and having a place to do our work. No, it means now we have a place we can call home. It's going to be a good opportunity for kids to like find like an actual good experience in the block inside of a gym instead of being inside of like a tight sweaty classroom. It would be a very limited room but we would also get the job done. It was hot for starters and then you can smell all the body odor <laughs> and we had like a limited amount of like boxing equipment so it was kind of like difficult for us to like train especially when a lot of new kids come every day. The nostalgia will still be there of being in the classrooms, being on the mezzanine uh, and training outside although that was brutal. We don't have to occupy someone else's, we don't have to share it, it's literally ours. It goes a long way in, you know, re I guess, kind of rebuilding the city. You can walk through the doors and instantly feel a part of somewhere. Thank you isn't even the words or the phrases that I could use to explain my gratitude. Not only you supported us, but you also supported Kids for the Future. You're changing lives year by year, day by day, week by week by giving the kids and the teens opportunity. You don't, I don't think you could possibly fully grasp how many lives and, and how many different ways you are touching somebody by donating to this program. We're now in the study room of the block. Academics play a central role in the programming of the block. That's because I have a passion for education. That's a passion that started when I was a kid in elementary school in Lexington, Kentucky, where I'm from. Unlike Chicago, Illinois, Lexington, Kentucky was forced to seek desegregate by the federal government after Brown v. Board of Education. That means that a kid like me, a poor black kid growing up in Lexington, had a chance to go to a well-resourced school. And that's exactly what happened. I went to one of the highest performing schools in, in, in the city of Lexington, uh, and I was doing really well for the first couple of years of my formal education. I was the kid uh, who would pull your card from green to yellow if we got caught acting up. Uh, that's how well I was doing. I was policing kids. Uh, typically, when I got home from school every day, my mom would sit me down at the kitchen table and she would make me do my homework. If I didn't show my work or if I spelled something wrong, if I wrote too sloppy, if I didn't erase a letter completely before I wrote over it, she made me do it again. She was tough. But one day we came home and our lights were off. And instead of sitting down and going over my homework with me, my mom was taking care of business on the phone with the electric company, talking to family. I'm not sure what was happening, but I knew I had an opportunity to halfway do my homework and get outside and play because, uh, because her attention couldn't be on me in that moment, rightfully. When I got my, when I turned my homework in the next day, uh, the teacher, immediately after I handed it in to her at her desk, called me out in front of the entire class, told me I didn't do a good enough job and I might as well have not turned it in. And I remember knowing that she didn't understand in that moment what it was that she was doing and just feeling deeply hurt and betrayed. Uh, she, then she took me out of my car changing duty. She said she couldn't trust me to get the job done anymore because I had halfway done a piece of homework. So when we moved from that school, I was pretty excited, but we moved into government housing and it was surrounded by other government housing in Lexington. Uh, and I remember walking in to school on the first day and seeing all the kids sitting down in a spelling lesson on the carpet and watching them sound out, and I believe it was third grade, Watching them sound out the words together and because when the last words I was spelling in my old, at my old school were phenomenal and unique. So, okay, something's different here. Something's not right, but I'm gonna roll with it. When the teacher hands me the paper that we're supposed to write on, it's the training paper with the dotted lines go down the middle. I hadn't seen that since kindergarten. And I remember in that moment, looking around the room, noticing that it was blacker than the room that I had come from and thinking, they think we're stupid. And I cried on my first day of class at this new school because I couldn't put a finger on it, but I knew something unfair was happening 
something unfair was going to keep happening to me and the very people who were supposed to educate me didn't believe in me and that was a hurtful experience i kept that in the back of my mind um, as i went through my education and when i got to college i uh, i got really serious about boxing i won the 2009 national collegiate boxing championship but i tore my rotator cuff in that boxing match and around the same time someone started talking to me about education and equality and how poor and black kids get a lower standard of education than their richer and whiter counterparts. And I knew that that's something I wanted to fight because I had felt it myself. So I joined Teach for America, started teaching, got my master's degree in secondary education. I married a woman with a master's degree in education and 10 years of teaching experience. Uh, and we moved to Chicago. A lot of people ask me why I started a boxing-based program if education is my passion. And the reason is, if you start a tutoring program, you're going to get a lot of kids who really want to join a tutoring program. If you start a boxing program, you end up attracting young people who want to fight. And you get to leverage that passion into something greater, into success inside and outside of the ring. That's why when we went to Fraser College Prep and we had kids walk into our classroom where we were setting up a boxing ring after get, being kicked off of their basketball team because they were academically ineligible with a 1.8 average GPA, come into our boxing program, join us, go on college trips with us, get tutored and mentored by our volunteers, uh, go on experiential learning trips with us, set goals with us. Doing that for five months, they grew from a 1.8 to a 3.2 GPA. That's why at DRW College Prep in our founding year as an organization, students in the program grew 40% more on their ACT than other students in the school. Mind you, the ACT is not an uh, accurate measure of college readiness. It's what it is a measure of is your experiences and your access to resources. And that's what studies have found, in, found in about the ACT. And still we were able to close that gap with the boxing program. We've grown at an aggressive rate because we know that this program works. So it's time to deepen our impact so we can have a profound impact and make profound changes in the communities that we're working with. We want to expand our college trip program to four trips per year so young people can normalize the experience of college, really get an idea of where they might want to go if they want to attend college, and make it, get it closer to becoming a reality. We need to get more laptops so the kids don't have to wait for technology and all kids can access the tech that they need to be excellent in academics. And we need to hire an academic coordinator. When we do that, we'll be able to send targeted interventions to individual students so that they can get the precise educational intervention that they need to grow into excellence. That's the program that you're supporting when you work with the block. And why is Tyler a success story? Ooh. Well, I wish you could see the trophies. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want him to box and I was mad. And then I thought um, it was because he had got jumped on his way home from school by some boys on Halloween. And I thought he wanted to use that as a form of retaliation, but it was totally different. Totally different. Tyler was always um, in a shell. He kept to himself. It, like I said, it brought him out. It gave him something to strive for. He loved boxing and he loved his, the block. And so that helped me to love the block because the block brought my baby out, out of a shell that I thought he was never going to come out of. It helped him advance in school. He's in college now, almost um, getting ready to graduate next year. Oh, time has flown. And like I said, he talks, you know. He used to he used to didn't talk to nobody. Tyler just sit there and just eat cheese. He didn't talk. <laughs> it gives the kids um, um, stability. It gives them uh, uh, self confidence. It gives them a, a reason, you know, something to strive for. It has made them more disciplined. I feel like I have to say less of the time. Do this. Do that. Um, I think the block gives them a sense of belonging and it also gives them structure. The block is about more than boxing because, I mean, yeah, you know, that's a focus, but it's not the primary focus. I love the idea of them going on college tours, going to different restaurants, trying new things, uh, going to things like the beach. You know, some kids don't get to experience those things. So that is a reason that I like the block because it's more than just boxing. One thing that surprises me about the blocks that kind of exceeded my expectation was um, the fact that they go on college tours and for the last three years, they've been consistently getting drilled education on top of boxing. Joseph and Jay Sean are success stories because in their 14 and 15 years, they've kind of had a hard life. 
and I feel like they've overcome a lot of obstacles because of the block and it kind of helps them deal with a lot of things outside of just boxing. The new space um, means that they now finally have a home. Joseph has his picture on the wall. I felt like that meant a lot to him because, you know, it's like, it's mine, here's my picture, this is a space we can call our own. I started the blog because I had a program that worked for young people. It's in my mind that if I have an idea that's good for the world, it's my responsibility to create it. It became quickly clear to me though, that having a good program is not enough to run a successful nonprofit. One of the spaces you just saw was our upstairs administrative offices, part of it. That's an important space for me because if we're gonna reach our full potential, we're gonna to need to increase our administrative capacity. If our technology is working correctly, you're seeing a live feed of what's happening in this space right now. With a three person staff, our community partners and a team of really dedicated volunteers, we mobilize a rapid response to meet the immediate needs that we were hearing about in our community. With buildings being looted, people didn't know where to shop. So we converted our strength and conditioning room and made it into a food pantry. None of this would be possible if we didn't have this building. And none of this will be possible if we don't build out an administrative staff. For the block to reach its potential, we'll need to recruit, train, and compensate a highly skilled administrative staff. Only then will we be able to find the people, connections, and resources that we'll need to make a massive change in our community. When we do that, we'll set an example for how to impact a community, one that listens to its people, meets them where they are, and pushes them to unprecedented heights. With this facility, we've taken a massive step in that direction. I hope you'll join the fight with us as we take our next steps. If you want more information on the block, you can follow any of the links that we have posted in our chat. You, there you can learn how to donate, volunteer, or just start a conversation with us to figure out how to get involved. I'll be sticking around for about 15 more minutes for a question and answer session, but if you have to take off, I am so glad that you came to this virtual grand opening. I can't thank you enough for being a part of this mission, and I hope this isn't the last time I hear from you. Please stay tuned as we impact our community. Thank you.